Hey everybody, this is Ron again. Today we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics. Well, actually, it's not one of my favorite topics. It's actually not one of anybody's favorite topics. I've personally been in business and industry and for a while in government for over 50 years. <clears throat> and during that time, I don't think I've ever met a single person who likes performance reviews. In fact, I don't even think I've ever even heard anything say said that was positive about performance reviews. Now you may be wondering why a safety guy is talking about performance evaluations, but let me tell you why. Anything that negatively affects the culture and the attitude of employees, supervisors, and managers is a bad thing. And if the culture is bad, you're going to have more injuries. And if you want to get a better culture, make more money, have fewer injuries, then you need to look into getting all the negative stuff out of your organization. <clears throat> so, back to performance evaluations. Uh, the title of this video is Why They Suck and How to Fix Them. It turns out they can be fixed. Not every organization has this problem. And if you're smart, you'll get this negativity, negativity out of your organization as well. So, what's the deal with performance evaluations? Well, as it turns out, nobody likes them. Employees dread them. Supervisors dread them. Managers dread them, executives dread them, and I think HR managers dread them too because they're all a pain. And they dread them because there's not anything really positive associated with them. Now you would think that an employee or manager would look forward to his evaluation every year because it's an opportunity for a raise. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. So why? Why don't we like them? Well, the reason is <clears throat> the process, the whole process is just rampant with negativity. <clears throat> the <clears throat> opportunity for a little bit of a raise is, just, is overshadowed by the negativity. They are time consuming. They're seen as subjective. So what good is a process that's subjective? If you've been in industry or management or government, it seems that the people that the boss likes gets the best raises. The boss doesn't like you, you will not get the best raises. That's just the way it looks. There are always unexpected gotchas. They're not perceived as constructive. There's minimal perceived value in them. And actually, neither the company nor the employee actually benefits from the process. So, why do we still do them? Why don't we do something different? It turns out that there is a better way. <clears throat> there is a better way. Every aspect of your company's performance is bounded by its culture. So whatever your culture is, that's how things are going to go. And if you don't have a good culture, and by good culture I'm talking about a culture of engagement, you're not going to have, your performance evaluation process is not going to be helpful. As a matter of fact, it's going to be the opposite of helpful. It's going to hold you back. So how do we fix this process? Companies that have good engagement with their employees know how to take this process and flip it over and make it positive instead of negative. And you can do the same thing if you want to. So, how do you do that? Well, <clears throat> in a nutshell, here's what we do. We take this process, we flip it around, and we make it a culture, or excuse me, a coaching or a collaboration process. 
So instead of having a meeting where you take the employee or the supervisor you're evaluating and just go through a list of things, okay, do, where are you, uh, do you play well with others? You score one to five. You go through and you score all these things. Those, those things don't mean anything because they're subjective. But <clears throat> if you turn it around and take this boss approach out of it and make it a coaching or collaborative process, you can turn it around. You do that by recasting the process, which I've just said. You don't do it just once or twice a year, which is the way most performance evaluations go. You do it at least every month. You sit down with a guy every month and you're having a collaboration and coaching session. So it's not one of those things where you beat the guy up or beat the employee up. You're coaching. You're mentoring. You're helping them grow. You're helping them get better. You're helping them contribute. That is positive. That is not negative. So, what you do is you become your team's coach, not the boss. It's a different way of thinking, but it can be done. Other companies are do it, doing it, and your company can do it as well. So, we're going to <clears throat> recast the process as a coaching process. We're going to have frequent, preferably monthly, coaching sessions. The other thing is you, as a manager or supervisor who's doing these evaluations, you're going to become, you're going to learn to become a coach. You're going to become a counselor. You're going to learn to become a mentor. You're going to do all of these things instead of being the boss. Because companies where this happens are more profitable, more stable, and have more stable workforces than companies that don't. You're going to change your personal paradigm of your role. You're now the coach or facilitator. You're a trainer. You're a teacher. You're an encourager. You're a problem solver. You're not the boss anymore. Your new low, excuse me, this new role, however, does require new skills. Supervising is a skill. Because it's a skill, skills can be taught and skills can be learned. So you can learn new skills. You can turn this around. You can adopt a consistent, documented coaching process for each employee or direct report, and that will facilitate holding them accountable for their performance, and you're getting more out of them because you're helping them grow their skills. They're becoming more skilled. They're able to handle more responsibility. They're able to get more done, and in turn, you're going to be more successful. So. The other thing that you need to do is you need to learn to focus on performance metrics. You need to get away from this thing that you've been doing is where you come to work every day and you deal with whatever comes your way. Most managers, most supervisors, and by most I mean two-thirds, come to work every day without a real plan. They deal with whatever happens. And stuff happens, and you deal with it, and there's always stuff that you have to deal with. But if you don't have a plan, you don't have goals, you're not ever going to get past this situation where you're just dealing with stuff that happens. So, we do this with something we call the GROW model. That's what I've been teaching. GROW talks about goals a review or the reality of the way things are, establishing ownership for the process, and defining a way forward. That is what's called the GOAT process. And as you begin your new role, there's some things that you need to be aware of. I've got some bullets here that I'll put up on the screen. There may be an official performance review process that's going to still remain, and you're still going to have to live with it. You're still going to have to live with something because most large organizations, most governmental organizations, all have a process in place, and it's all the same. You get questions either on paper or on the computer. Does Fred play well with others? 
Does Fred come up with good ideas? Score one to five. You know, there's usually a dozen or so questions and usually one or two or three goals. It's, it's a terrible process, but you have to live with it sometimes. If you're in a position to change the process, by all means, change the process. Now, you have a new job. You're a coach. You're a mentor. You're a counselor. You're not the boss anymore, so stop being the boss. You will be spending your time and your effort training, mentoring, and negotiating, not bossing. That's the old way. When you're bossing, you have one person, you, that's got all the stuff in his head, and you're using the stuff in your head to make decisions and figure out how, to things, how things work. Once you become the mentor, the coach, the counselor, if you've got five people working for you, five people who report to you, then you actually have six people now coming up with ideas. Six people is a lot more effective than one person. So you need to get out of your head that you're the only person that has any good ideas. A lot of these guys have been in this business, whatever business you're in for years, they all have ideas. They all have brains. Now some of their ideas are not really great ideas, I know, but you have to work through them. People will support what they help create. And if it's their idea, even if you may not think it's the best idea, they'll figure out a way to make it work. It puts the emphasis on them. You no longer have to shoulder the responsibility for everything and making everything work. Let them take the reins. They want to. Okay. Another skill in your new role. Learn the magic of asking open-ended questions. This is extremely important because this is how you draw out ideas from your reports. You ask them open-ended questions. Another thing that you probably never ever thought of, you need to take the word why out of your vocabulary. The reason is why it always brings up negative connotations. Why didn't you get to work on time? Why did this part not get corrected or measured correctly? Why was this delivery late? <clears throat> Why was this mistake made? When you bring those up, use that word why, it automatically triggers the defense mechanism in whoever you're speaking to. That is negative. It's not constructive. You're going to learn to ask open-ended questions, and you're going to learn to get the information you need without creating that negativity. Okay, next goal, next item. <clears throat> when you're talking to a person about, hey, Fred, um, this billet is too short. What, what can we do about this? And Fred looks at it and says, well, I guess I measured it too short. Well, what are we going to do about it, Fred? Or better yet, Fred, what can you do to fix this? And Fred's going to say, the first thing he's probably going to say is, oh, I'm going to try harder. I'll do better next time. Don't accept a non-specific answer. Ask him again. Fred, what, are we, what can you do to fix this? You may have to ask the same similar question three or four times to get an answer. But the answer you're looking for is one where he gives you something specific, something that he or she can implement that you don't have to do. That's what you're looking for. So maybe he'll give you an answer like, well, I'll, after every billet that I cut, I'm going to brush the chips off the stop so that uh, those chips aren't back there and I won't measure incorrectly because of the built-up. Okay, there's an example of something positive that Fred can do. You can also... Uh, set metrics if you want to for that kind of thing. But in this process, what you've done is when you do that, you have taken that, in, that effort on fixing that problem off of you and it's now on Fred. You have enough to do.
Brad needs to take responsibility for his own work. So when you have goals and you help the employee set goals that fit within the things that you need to have done, then they're their goals and not your goals. And when they set the goals, they'll make them work. So the other thing you always want to remember is if once you have this and you have success, always give the employee credit for the success. It's the employee that needs the credit, not you. Once your organization or your department or your section or your platoon or whatever becomes successful, the bosses will notice. They know who the supervisor in charge of that is. They know. <clears throat> so <clears throat> let's back up to give a quick overview of the grow process in general. Step one is either establishing or reviewing or reestablishing goals. You always want to have at least one goal that's ongoing. You don't want to have more than four. Probably two is about right because you're going to be reviewing these monthly, not annually, like a real, like I say, a real, like an actual performance review because we're not going to wait that long to solve a problem. We're not going to take our problems and stretch them out over a year or six months. We want our problems to be solved within a month and move on to the next one. You solve a problem, you add another goal. You solve a problem, you add another goal. So you never want to have more than a couple, of maybe three goals, four at the most. The more experience an employee has, the more goals they can handle. So if you've got a new person, don't give them more than one goal. If you've got a guy that's been there 15 or 20 years, he might be able to handle four goals. So give it a little thought. Always be sure that your coaching is safe. You want to make sure that you uh, don't do your coaching and stuff in front of other people. It needs to be in a, in a semi-private uh, meeting or environment because coaching is a personal relationship building process and not everybody needs to be a part of it because everyone is going to have their own coaching interaction. Step two, we're going to look at the reality of where you're at. How many pieces an hour have you been making? George, you're making three pieces an hour. Why can't we do six? Oops, I used that word. Why? Shame on me. George, you're doing three pieces an hour. What can we do to get to six? Give it to George. Put it in his lap. Well, George, what, what do you think is reasonable? And, and what if we do something different, what can we do and then what can we expect? Let George answer those questions. Let George pick the goal. Let George figure out what to do to... So, <clears throat> a lot of times when you have a goal, you'll say, okay, George, this is your goal on a scale of 1 to 10. How did you do? Well, I did a 5. Okay, what do we have to do to get to a 6? Let George answer that question. Sometimes you may have a guy that says, okay, I'm doing 10. I'm doing the best that I can do. There's no point in arguing with them because it's a subjective evaluation and they're going to give their opinion. But you still ask the question, okay, you're a 10. What do we have to do to do better? You can always add to whatever they come up with. Okay, step three, generate options. Ask, what happened? Why didn't we get six parts an hour. Why are we getting just three? Look at that word, why? Let's don't do that. I have to train myself as well. Keep asking until, keep asking what you can do and what needs to be changed until you get an answer or two. You may have to ask four or five times. In a few cases, you may have to kind of lead them to an answer. But be very careful about that because remember the answer has to be their answer, not your answer. Because you want them 
to come up with a plan to meet that goal or make that change. Not you. You have enough to do. So, if they got several ideas, you can just select one of the two that you think are the best ones, and uh, you, that can become your, the employee's new goal, and they can work on it. Remember, no one disagrees with their own ideas. People will support what they help create, and it's important for you as a supervisor or manager that you learn to do that. Next, define the way forward. This is the final step in the growth process and it is pivotal. Review with the employee your expectations. You're reviewing the goal and the process of the way forward that they've already said they were able to do. So, if Fred says, I think that if I calibrate my machine um, or clean up my chips while my machine's running a previous part, then that'll save me a minute or two and I can get more, more parts machined every day. Okay, whatever the situation turns out to be. You review with them. Okay, Fred, you just told me that you thought that you could clean your chips while the machine is running and that way you'll be able to get more parts out of it. Is that right? Did, did I hear that? Okay, you, uh, you set that expectation. That's going to become your goal. If you did a good job with the first three steps, then the coachee knows that they own that, that process. And all you're doing is holding them accountable with, to what they've already agreed that they can do. That's how this process works. Now, that is a sort of a nutshell, an abbreviated approach to summary, I guess is a better word, to how the process works. It does take some education to help the supervisors and managers learn the process. So if that's you, you can learn this process. It's a skill. You're going to learn some <clears throat> ways to do things. Skills can be taught. Skills can be learned, and if you already have some skills, those skills can be improved. So you never start, if you have a skill, if you're, for example, you're a journeyman welder or a carpenter, yeah, you know some stuff, but there's always other stuff that you can learn. You need to be continually increasing and improving your skill set. So no matter where you are on the spectrum, there are more things that you can learn. The important thing is to learn that you're changing your role. You're no longer going to be the boss. It's no longer going to be all on you to figure out how to make things work. You have to learn how to let other people contribute. The people that are actually doing the work, they have to learn to contribute. They, they will grow in the process as well as you because you're going to be helping them train on new ideas and you're going to help them focus on things and you're going to be giving them ownership. So if this process has any interest to you, if you want to know more, you can get in touch with me. There's some contact information on the last slide and um, you can also comment on this video and I look forward to seeing those comments and then and uh, there will be a few of you who want to contact me, and that's great. And I look forward to that as well. You guys have a great day, and goodbye.